Beloved Church, happy Sunday. We are so glad to have each of you here worshiping with us in person, and we are glad that those of you who are with us online are also able to join us this morning. I am the Reverend Sarah Schmidt Lee. I am one of the pastors here at the First Congregational Church in Kalamazoo, and I am sharing worship leadership this morning with Tom Powell, our liturgist, and with the Reverend Caroline Myers, who is not the person printed in the bulletin for preaching this morning. The Reverend Elizabeth, the Reverend Dr. Elizabeth Candido had a family emergency this weekend and got in touch with Caroline and I, and Caroline was gracious enough to pick up her sermon and complete it and be prepared to deliver it this morning. So we will remember the Candido family in our prayers this morning and express gratitude to Caroline for her flexibility. <laughs> I invite you to take a look at your connection cards this morning. If you are visiting us, this is a great way for us to learn a little bit about who you are and make sure we can be in touch with you. Um, but if, this, if you have been coming for decades, there's still something new on the connection card every week. So take a look at upcoming events that you can sign up for or share with us ways that we can be praying for you. The connection card really is a way that we on staff can be connected to you who are members of the church um, and also help you get connected to things that are happening and ways to be involved and to serve in the life of the church. This church, Kalamazoo First Congregational Church, is a member church in the United Church of Christ. And each time we gather, we reaffirm that no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. Good morning, everybody. It's Tom Powell. 
I'll be the liturgist this morning. I've been a member of this church since 1956 when I was confirmed here. I grew up here. A couple years after Carol Krennic, a couple years before Ann Desort. That's my era. <laughs> it's a pretty long time ago. I would like to invite you to stand and we'll do the call, for, call to worship. In the beginning, O oh God, all is darkness, formless and empty. Light, you say, and there is light, and the light is the life of all people. In the desert, water flows, and you invite us to dive in, to drink, to delight. Christ, river of life, we come to you. Spirit, dove of peace, pure energy of love, you sing out in us. We are your beloved, in whom you are well pleased. Creator of all, we are immersed in your grace, and we are made new. Created anew and carrying your light, we come to offer our worship and praise. Now, please join me in the opening prayer for the season. God of light, star of love, eternal beginning and grace without end, we fix the eyes of our hearts on you. Guide us this day to where we shall see Christ and kneel and share what gifts we have to offer. And having seen you, May we leave this place changed, following your spirit by a new way. Amen.
you may be seated, and I'll invite forward any of the kids who would like to participate in this morning's blessing. Good morning. Thank you for sitting nicely here. Oh, yay. It's Dahlia. Good morning. It is good to have you here too, Spencer. Dahlia is here holding the little puppy. Yeah? Okay, so did you all see some hearts in the atrium this morning? Oliver, did you see some hearts out there in the atrium? Yeah. Yeah, and there's a heart back here too, made out of metal, and it kind of looks like leaves. You'll have to look for it when you go sit back down. There are candy hearts, too, out there. Oh, my goodness. So why do you think there's so much red stuff and so many hearts? For Valentine's Day. For Valentine's Day. Yeah, that's coming up this week, isn't it? And what is Valentine's Day about? Any idea? Do you know what Valentine's Day is about, Spencer? Well, the hearts are a clue. Uh, actually, actually, you put hearts on there and, and literally like, it says, I love you. It's a card. I love you. Yeah. yeah. So Valentine's Day is about love, and it's about showing the people that we love that we love them, right? Yeah. So do you think that God loves you? I know, it's true, right? I wonder how it is that we know that God loves us. How do you know that God loves you? I don't know. I don't know? Yeah, it's just a thing that we've been told. I, it's a lot easier for me to remember that God loves me when there's sunshine. God loves everyone on this earth. God loves everyone on this earth. Oh my goodness. So, as we get close to Valentine's Day, I want us to think about how much God loves us and every person on the earth, and how we can show God's love to the people that we see. There's more people in here than the earth. The earth is <laughs> you ready for the blessing, Oliver? We're going to raise a hand, and everybody out there is too, okay? Dear God, thank you for your love. And thank you for Jesus, who loves us. We love you. Help us to share your love. Amen. Thanks, folks. Uh, the scripture this morning comes from the Old Testament, Psalm 119. We're only going to read verses 1 through 8. It has 176. <laughs> I looked it up in my Bible, and it's page after page after page. I'm saying, whoa. Happiness comes to those whose way is blameless, who walk in your law, God. Happiness comes to those who keep your decrees and seek you with all their heart. And do no wrong, but walk in your ways. You have commanded that your precepts be kept diligently. If only I were more faithful in keeping your statutes, then I wouldn't feel so ashamed when I look at all your commands. I will thank you with an upright heart when I truly learn to be as just as you want me to be, I will obey your statutes. Do not utterly forsake me. Hear what the Spirit of God is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. Servant 
Thank you. Want to stand up with that? That, that was it. <laughs> Second scripture is from Matthew's Gospel, part of the Sermon of the Mount on the Mount that we have been reading from for the past few weeks. And Jesus says to the disciples gathered around, You've heard that our ancestors were told no killing, and every murderer will be subject to judgment. <clears throat> but I tell you that everyone who is angry with a sister or brother is subject to judgment. Anyone who says to the sibling, their sibling, I spit in your face, will be subject to the Sanhedrin. And anyone who vilifies them with name-calling will be subject to the fires of Gehenna. If you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your sibling has a grudge against you, Leave your gift there at the altar. Go first and be reconciled to them, and then come offer your gift. Lose no time in settling with your opponents. Do so while still on the way to the courthouse with them. Otherwise, your opponents may hand you over to the judge, and the judge hand you over to the bailiff, who will throw you into prison. I warn you, you won't get out until you have paid the last penny. You have heard the commandment, no committing adultery. <clears throat> but I tell you that those who look lustfully at another have already committed adultery with them in their hearts. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and throw it away. It is better to lose part of your body than to have it all cast into Gehenna. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better to lose part of your body than to have it all cast into hell. It was also said, whenever a couple divorces, each partner must get a decree of divorce. But I tell you that everyone who divorces, except because of adultery, forces the spouse to commit adultery. 
and those who marry the divorced also commit adultery. Hear what the Spirit of God is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. <coughs> that might not be one of those scriptures that you feel like saying thanks be to God about <coughs> after hearing it. Would you join with me in prayer? Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations in our hearts be acceptable to you, our strength, our song, and our salvation. Amen. As Sarah mentioned earlier, Liz Candido was planning to be here and had begun writing her sermon, and then there was a family emergency that came up. And so this is a hybrid today. We're used to getting, we're getting used to hybrids in different forms. This is a hybrid today, but I want you to let to know whenever there is an I in the sermon, that is Liz's I, and she is speaking from her experience, and so I'm delivering that from her experience. Today concludes our hearing of Jesus' lessons from the Sermon on the Mount. And you've heard already the Beatitudes, the teachings on salt and light, the fulfillment of the law in Christ. And that leaves me today with the easy parts, murder, hell, adultery, divorce. Thanks so much, preaching team. <clears throat> in truth, Jesus' sermon goes on for a few more paragraphs following today's reading. But this part of the sermon that we're in now, I actually do believe is the most interesting part. Before we've been given a vision of what God's commonwealth, what Matthew refers to as the kingdom of heaven, looks like. Power is inverted, the weak become powerful, the merciful are blessed, the peacemakers are called children of God. And similarly, we have been reminded that the power to bring about this world rests in the hands of people like you and me. We are the salt. We are the light. Jesus has painted a vision of the world that he brings. And if you're like me, you're of two minds about this. I want to live in that world that is promised. And I even sometimes catch glimpses of it. But there is another truth that lives inside me too. The truth that I actually live in this world, the one where injustice reigns, where my choices are difficult and life is complicated. I live in a world where the peacemakers are often called troublemakers rather than children of God. And I think we all know <coughs> that those of us who hunger and thirst for righteousness have not yet been filled. We live in the in-between, in the time where the commonwealth of God is with us and also just beyond us, always on the horizon. And it may be 2,000 years since Jesus spoke all these words, but I promise you that the people back then were thinking the same thing. This is a beautiful vision. But how do we get from here to there? And this is exactly what Jesus turns to next in his sermon, the readings we have today. How do we live these commitments? How do we enact Christ fulfillment to be the salt and light? What does that mean for the very complicated problems of our day? Jesus starts by giving us a rather traditional formulation. You have heard it said, in other words, the Hebrew scriptures, the Ten Commandments, all those things have always said, do not murder. And then he continues, but I say to you, even if you are angry with one of your siblings, another of God's children, <clears throat> you are liable to judgment. In this way, Jesus takes the lessons of his day and age and extends them. He doesn't abolish the old rules. He doesn't do away with murder or the prohibition to murder. <coughs> Instead, he makes a distinction between outward observance and inward change. You can't just follow the rule of no murder. That's far too low a bar. Instead, 
In the commonwealth of God, we will work to discipline even what is in our hearts. The anger and aggression, the rifts that tear us from one another, those are things that we will seek to overcome, all as part of what it means not to murder. The struggle becomes one of the spirit, not just following the rules. Similarly, we can't just abstain from adultery. We need to examine our wayward desires that lead us into temptation. The examination is internal and deep and th totally thoroughgoing. To be oriented toward the co God's commonwealth means an ongoing commitment to this inner work. 500 some years ago, Martin Luther tried to put this into words in his small catechism, which went from merely memorizing the Ten Commandments to opening up a further understanding of what they meant, and then, yes, memorizing that. So, for instance, in the commandment not to murder, Luther writes, what does this mean? We are to fear and love God that we may not hurt nor harm our neighbor, but help and befriend them in every bodily need. When addressing the commitment not to commit adultery, the commandment not to commit adultery, Luther expands this to say that we are to fear and love God that we may live a chaste and decent life in words and deeds, and each love and honor one's spouse. Similarly, in the commandment not to steal, Luther says that it means we are to fear and love God, that we may not take our neighbor's money or property, nor get them by false wares or dealing, but help them to protect and improve their property and business. <coughs> Though I take issue with Luther's insistence that we fear God. I might use revere or respect to get at the point instead. I do appreciate his clarity that living in God's way is not simply or even primarily about keeping the prohibitive rules. It is about noticing where our heart and our intentions lie, noticing where we are in relationship to others and living in proactive care. It's not about staying out of hell, but about extending the bounds of heaven in our own lives and within our own reach. Indeed, Jesus in this sermon to his disciples is talking about cultivating ethics, not disciplining specific actions. Certainly one way of taking these scriptures is as a giant walking guilt trip. Every time I'm mad at someone, I'm killing them. Every time you look at another person sexually, you're committing adultery. And that certainly could function as a pretty significant boulder to be rolling up the hill in an attempt to live a Christian life. But since Christ came to give us life abundant, I suspect that wasn't likely the purpose of these teachings. Even worse, Christian history is full of instances where we have turned these scriptures into weapons. But I want you to notice that there is no police force involved in Jesus' teachings. The inner work he calls his listeners to is personal, a deep commitment within oneself to be radical, to search for the inner root of our own attitudes and actions. There is no call here for you or anyone else to police that behavior in another. Jesus does not say, cut off your neighbor's hand when she sins. <coughs> his advice is for each of us alone as his followers and how we each might discipline ourselves. And that's it. When I was in seminary, I had a professor who regularly reminded us that anything we preach, we are responsible for. Every interpretation of scripture is a choice. And so it would be wrong not to notice that these exact passages have been used to hurt others for actions they have taken or are perceived to have taken, specifically against women, children, gays, and lesbians. I think of all the women who have been forced to stay in terrible marriages because divorce was not permitted. 
or the physical and psychological abuse inflicted upon those condemned under scripture of one sort of an, or another. What I'm saying is that when we set up a bar and say anything that crosses this line is sinful, we've missed the point. Jesus is pointing at the kingdom of heaven and trying to describe the sort of radical ethic it takes to inhabit that commonwealth in the here and now. And so we have to be careful to keep looking at where he is pointing and not get distracted by the examples. And we most certainly shouldn't feel any license to call other people out on their sins. After all, we have just been taught that the meek in inherit the earth. In fact, I think Jesus is doing in this text what we're all always trying to do, and that's figure out how to live out our faith. Jesus has told us about how the kingdom of heaven changes everything, and he's providing examples from his time and place for what that might mean. I think if Jesus were with us here today, he would wrestle with the conflicts in the front and center of our own lives and would use them as examples that point us toward how to live more radically, more spiritedly, more caringly as citizens of God's commonwealth. February is Black History Month. We only have a Black History Month because of the per pervasive erasure of contributions to our common life of black people in our society. In this time when Florida has limited all advanced placement black history curriculum, and in which we have literally witnessed the lynching of Tyree Nichols by the state, I have to believe that Jesus would name racism as one of those places of conflict that we all need to look at and wrestle with in ourselves and in our society at large. You have heard it said you must treat all people equally, but I tell you that your obligation is to go deeper, to go to the root, to carve out the causes of the disease of pet prejudice and racism within you. And that is where the real work lies, the deep work, the investigation of our souls and aligning them with Christ, with the countercultural values of God's realm. Wouldn't it be easier if he had just left us with a list of do's and don'ts? Here are 16 things to do to be a good Christian. But no, nope. the work of the kingdom starts with those basics, but the real work is inside ourselves, fostering within ourselves the courage and compassion and grace to let God's commonwealth, God's kingdom, appear here and now in our lives. To do that inside work, we need to grapple with, among other things, the ways white supremacy and other oppressions shape and form us. We need to examine what deep-seated fears, and here I very deliberately mean the word fears, cause us to hurt and harm our neighbors and keep us from befriending them in every bodily need. Let's just take two verses from today's gospel reading and see what grappling with that might look like. Beginning in verse 23, Jesus gives some concrete advice for action. So when you are offering your gift at the altar, if you remember that your sibling has a grudge against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to them and then come and offer your gift. Simple, right? Next time I bring a fatted calf to the altar for sacrifice, I'll think if I've hurt anybody lately, and if so, I'll go say I'm sorry, and then come back and finish the offering. If only it were that easy. If we read Jesus' words more closely, he is asking us to go so much deeper than a breezy apology interrupting our previously scheduled activities. First of all, let's look at the setting where you are offering your gift at the altar. Jesus sets his words in the context of worship, in the offering of our gifts to God. In the commonwealth of God where we are salt and light, 
When aren't we in worship? When are our gifts not being offered to God? So this isn't about a thought interrupting our Sunday morning ritual. It's about thoughtfulness being part of our every moment. Apparently, God thinks taking care of our broken relationships is more important than going through the motions of worship. Loving God and loving our neighbor as ourselves really are all bound up together on equal footing. And then there's the way Jesus phrases what he wants us to be thoughtful about. If you remember that your sibling has something against you, the Greek word for sibling there, often translated as brother, is adelphos. It literally means one who shares the womb with you. If we're all children of God, though, doesn't that make all of us womb mates? And Jesus doesn't ask us to remember if we've done something hurtful. He asks us to consider whether there's someone else who might have something against us. It's a deliberately vague request. And it asks us to think about things from someone else's point of view, to go beyond our immediate way of seeing or thinking about ourselves, and to consider more deeply how others might feel and how our attitudes or actions might have affected them. And then Jesus charges his listeners to drop our gifts at the altar and go, to be reconciled with whoever is hurting because of us. Not just to say I'm sorry and call it work, call it good, but to work to repair what has been broken. <clears throat> the Greek word for reconcile here is dialasso, and it can be translated as to mutually transform. That's going to take more than a minute. For mutual transformation and reconciliation to happen, there must be vulnerability, willingness both to speak and to hear hard truths, deep listening, understanding, repentance, forgiveness, commitment to a future relationship. This internal and communal work could take hours or days or a lifetime. By the time you get back to the altar, the fatted calf could have run off and had babies of its own. But at that point, the gift you'd be able to offer God and the world after all that time and deep work will be of so, so much more value. Here we are in worship. Here we are in Black History Month. Here we are with Jesus' call to go beyond mere rules and to live in the spirit of God's commonwealth, to align ourselves with Christ and the countercultural values of God's realm, to wrestle with how we live out our faith in real time. What fellow children of God do we need to remember have something against us? What do we need to drop right here in order to start the journey toward reconciliation? What fears keep us from starting that journey? What gifts of ours could be transformed in the process? If only Jesus had given us that list of 16 things to do to be a good Christian. Instead, he gave us himself and each other and a vision. And then he pointed the way. Amen. Now for the offertory. This is the part of the worship experience where you are invited to share your gifts. God gave us the gifts of a beautiful creation, our talents, and our church and leadership teams. On this morning, we come together to thank God and to offer our gifts so that the ministry of this church 
will continue to grow and be a blessing to the world. Let us gather our guests together and offer them to God in gratitude and praise. Also, please take a moment to complete your connection card, and you can place that in the offering basket when it passes. Or if you don't have time, please feel free to put it in one of the baskets which are at the exits as you leave today. At this time, the ushers will come forward to collect your offerings. A natural man. Samson was a witness for my Lord. Samson was a witness for my Lord. Samson was a witness for my Lord. Saul is a witness for my Lord. There's another witness. There's another witness. There's another witness. There's another witness. There's another witness.
loving God, we give you thanks for every gift you have given to us. The gifts of the earth, the gifts of each other. And we pray that the gifts we bring before you today may extend our witness of your love to those in need in our city and in our world. Amen. You may be seated. In our prayers this morning, we will continue to participate in the Southwest Association Prayer Project, where we remember another church in this region, knowing that somewhere in the southwest corner of Michigan, another church is praying for us as well. I also want to add to our joys and concerns list our friend Alan Galley. Many of you remember Alan. Um, who was here as a regular attendee and also in the building on weekdays before COVID. Um, Alan moved into Rose Arbor this weekend in hospice care. Um, so we will have him on our prayer list. And if anybody would like to join me in being one of the visitors um, at Rose Arbor, let me know and we can put together a little schedule for the coming weeks. Please join your hearts with mine in prayer. Loving God, we give you thanks for sunshine, for the promise of spring, we give you thanks for the stirrings that we see in this community, the creativity that has sprung out of dormancy the promises of possibility. We pray this week for our siblings at Pilgrim Congregational Church in St. Joseph and their pastor, the Reverend Mike Mulberry. And we pray that they may also be encouraged by signs of your spirit at work among them. We pray for those members of our community who are ill, injured, who are in rehab, and in hospice. We pray for all of the medical caregivers who are supporting them and their bodies and their spirits. We pray for the caregivers in our own congregation each person who is caring for a parent or a spouse, children or grandchildren, neighbors, friends. We pray for your spirit of strength and encouragement to sustain each person who is caring for a loved one. We pray for those who are grieving. Those who are depressed. Those who have anxiety or other mental health issues that make it difficult to see hope on the horizon or solutions to challenges in their lives. We pray for your spirit of encouragement to be with them this morning. And we pray for our world, for communities in Turkey that are recovering from an earthquake, for communities on every continent that are living in fear of violence, for communities in our own country that are reeling from natural disasters or environmental disasters. We pray for recovery and protection. And we pray for your people in each of these communities to be inspired by your spirit 
to be part of bringing solutions and healing and health. God, that's who we want to be in Kalamazoo. And so we pray for your inspiration in our hearts and minds as well. As we return again to those words that Jesus taught his disciples, saying, Our mother and father, Good morning. So first I want to say, thank you, Caroline. It's a lot to jump in and take over when you weren't planning to. And I have no doubt you had plans and you gave them up for us. So I really want to thank you. I also want to thank um, Joe Howard Tammy, Coraline, for the spiritual music this morning. I, I could have you sing that every Sunday. <laughs> and to Corey, also for accompanying. So um, the gifts we have is unbelievable. I come from a really big football family. Um, my father, who played football through his youth and college was even invited to play semi-pro. I didn't get this big from nothing. I come by it honestly. All three of my brothers played football from their youth through college, were captains of their football teams. So football is big in my family. And I will be going to a um, Super Bowl party this afternoon or evening, um, which has been a tradition in our family on some form or another. And I recently read that the Super Bowl is fast becoming our country's biggest holiday, which is fascinating that we gather. It, Thanksgiving is also a holiday that crosses all faiths, religions, etc. Um, doesn't matter, and football is doing that too. Even though the participation in football is dropping, even though the participation in even going to big football games or high school or college is dropping, but Super Bowl continues to be a big thing. And I think about that from the point of view that we're all looking for more community. And going to a Super Bowl party just allows us to go and gather. Some of us watch the commercials, I do. Some of us watch the game or a combination. We eat a lot of food we don't allow ourselves normally. Um, but it's community and we're longing for community. And I know I am and I believe all you are. And our church right now is offering some opportunities for us to participate in community. And I want to encourage all of you to consider. Um, if you look in your bulletin, I had it open, but of course I've, we have something called Shrove um, Dinner Tuesday on the 21st. Please join us. Kelly, who's been so gracious to pull it together, I noticed all the food has been called for, so you don't have to cook, you don't have to bring anything, you just need to sign up and come. And second, after that, we have the Lenten services on Tuesday. Please come to that. It's our opportunity to see each other, be together in community, to share food, to laugh, to meet each other if we don't know each other, to catch up. So please join us in those two important activities. 
And my last thing is, it's Valentine's Day this week, and I have another simple request. Call somebody, text somebody that you haven't seen here in a long time. Reach out on Valentine's Day. Send them a note. You don't have to send them a card. Just reach out. Somebody you haven't seen here in a while, just reach out. Love on them. We're all hungry for love. Now, I'm going to ask you to join me in our church prayer. As members of Christ's body and of one another, unique parts of a beloved whole, we give thanks for this gathering and for the one who gathers us. In our scattering, may we remain together in spirit, reflecting God's love in all we do. Amen. And before we stand to sing our last hymn, which is found on page eight, Corey would like to guide us through how to do it successfully. Change My Heart, O God, is a hymn that has evolved since its creation. And as you're looking in your bulletin, I'm going to tell you what we're going to do so it's smooth for us all. First, you could ignore page nine. We're not going to use it. Um, and the second change, as we follow along together, is on page eight, you'll be singing the, the bottom three verses. They're all in italics, and they start with change our hearts. Let us stand. Receive these words of blessing from the Reverend Howard Thurman. Open unto us light for our darkness, O God. Open unto us courage for our fear. Open unto us hope for our despair. Open unto us peace for our turmoil. Open unto us joy for our sorrow. Open us unto us strength for our weakness. Open unto us wisdom for our confusion. Open unto us forgiveness for our sin. Open unto us tenderness for our toughness. Open unto us love for our hates. 
Open unto us thyself for ourself. Lord, Lord, open thyself unto us. Open ourselves unto thee. Lord, Lord, open unto us. Amen.